Hello, welcome to a one hour real time painting demo. Let's just jump right into it. So here's my palette. I'm gonna list um, in the comment section below or the drop down bar if this is on YouTube, um, basically all of these colors and then a more limited version. This is my full palette, so it's pretty extensive, but for a portrait, you definitely don't need something that's extensive, but I'm just showing you everything I have. Um, I'm also using for a medium uh, solvent free gel by uh, Gal Kid. This gives me as close to an acrylic paint sort of viscosity as I can get. And it's also solvent free, which is great. I try to paint without solvent. So here I have safflower oil in a jar. Um, and this is mostly what I clean my paints on until I need to do a full end of the week painting cleaning session. <laughs> um, but this is the oil and it's a great system. It works pretty good so far. I also mix in a little bit of clove oil. Um, not only does this smell really nice, but um, it keeps the uh, paint from solidifying. It's just a great thing to have. In addition, I've seen some other people suggest this, so I'm trying it out. Um, I'm gonna be doing a lot of mixing with a palette knife. There's no specific palette knife you need to have. I really like this one. Again, I will link it um, down below. This is my reference photo. I'm gonna go ahead and include it in the drop down. I found it off Pinterest. I don't know if I have the rights to it. I'm not selling this painting. Um, I'm just, this will be a restricted video for just y'all, but um, yeah, this is, I thought this was a really nice photo. The light was really good and I really enjoy painting portraits at this three-fourths composition. Um, but yeah, let's just jump right into it. So what I'm mixing here is, this can be as wide, ornate, encompassing, however you want to say that, or as limited as you'd like. Um, but whenever I'm doing a portrait, it can be really hard to know where to start. You know, skin tones you would think are pretty narrow in the sense that it's just one color of pigment all over your body, right? That's kind of how maybe it's easy to think about it. But um, in reality, your skin is not only reflecting light in a bunch of different colors and hues and directions and warmth and coolness and you know all that stuff but your um, skin is also more translucent in some places and there's hair growth that affects the color there's also different textures you know skin around joints can be more velvety and cool and you know an, a person you know average or whatever is it has a lot of variation to their skin whether that's something obvious like freckles or you know just the slight changes and so it can be hard to know where to jump in I feel like when I first started doing portraits my people kind of looked like kaleidoscopes which isn't inherently a bad thing but this is a method that um, I've pieced together from a bunch of different teachers that I think you know is really helpful way to jump into portraits okay so what am I mixing right here I am mixing um, an average shadow um, roughly average and what I mean by average is think of it in the kind of mathematical sense so if we took a lasso tool in Photoshop which is just kind of a way to select all the parts of the model space that are in shadow and we mixed all of those colors together what color would we get I like to mix this color and have it lean warm and have one lean cool so I'm looking at the reference photo the whole time. I'm, I'm really making sure that I can find this color or something close to it on the, the you know, I'm not mixing this out of my head. I'm, I'm really staying pretty true to the, the photo. But the idea is that I'm looking for an average dark, um, an average, or rather, an average shadow, and then an average, the, and then in that color, I try to have it lean warm and lean cool. Um, by warm, you know, for this model, she has a lot of yellow ochre in the lit parts of her face, a very yellowy, earthy color. And I find that in her shadows, there's a lot of warmth. And that, again, that's because skin is full of blood and, you know, we reflect light off of our skin in different ways. Um, but she certainly has parts of her face that are in shadow that are also cool, like the, the hollow of her cheek and underneath her jaw, where it's not reflecting back any warmth. So all of the colors I'm going to have you guys mix are going to have a warm version and then a cool version. Um, and this is just a way of organizing how we look at the face and what colors we're seeing, right? And if this all sounds too much, you can totally disregard, but this is what I think would have been really helpful for me when I first started painting. Um, it's a little bit of order. It's a little bit of reigning in the chaos of how to, how to paint all the colors and skin tone while it looks, so it looks lifelike and, um, and also doesn't feel overwhelming. Okay. So 
the three colors on the left are my shadows. I have a warm cool and I ended up mixing an average. You don't have to do that step. And then the top colors I mixed, the second piles I started are my highlights or not really highlights as in like the, you know, the shiny little whites that are on the tip of your nose or in the whites of your eyes. But I just mean like the planes of the face that are capturing the most light. So this is going to be the the lip forms, you know, the, the, the plane of the forehead, the bridge of the nose, the top of the chin, maybe the top of the cheeks. And for that, I found a warm version and a cool version. The warm ver version was really yellow. The cool version was more of a taupey neutral color. Um, she certainly has some cools in her skin, but um, I'm just going for averages right now instead of mixing every color I see on her skin. And then the three colors in the middle that um, I mixed are the average lit. So it's less of a highlight and more of just what I call half tones. So that's another key vocabulary word to keep in mind. Half tones are basically just the lit shapes that happen when the shadow sort of fades into the lit parts of the face. So think the contour of the cheek or how the temple sort of fades into the front plane of the face. Um, it's really just those transitional colors. Um, you know, you can call these, basically you can consider them just an extension of the lit parts of the face. Um, but sometimes it's nice to use the term uh, half tones just to describe those places that are like not quite shadow, not quite, quite lit. It's sort of in between, it's a half tone. Um, I'm mixing up some hair color and then some cooler colors. There are some really lovely violet -y patches on the model's face and I'm wanting to make sure to get that. Um, a question that you may have is, can you do this with acrylics? And certainly you can, it may not work to mix it all in the beginning, but you can certainly mix as you go. And the idea of mixing up an average shadow and then an average light, that still totally applies um, with acrylics, but this pre-mixing is kind of unique to oils. Um, but here are my average shadows. I did a warm, cool, and a neutral. This is my average highlights. Um, and then my average lit. You can also consider this sort of your half tones, but um, I'm considering them just, you know, the it's gonna be the bulk of the face. And then I mixed a dark hair color with um, some grays and blues that I know are gonna be in different parts of the face. Okay, let's jump into the drawing. Um, certainly there's a way to do this and make it super accurate and really measure it out. I would suggest if you're newer, I would measure out this a little bit using the strategy I have in my foundations class. Maybe just go watch the drawing section. It's a lot of like measuring and using a dowel rod. Um, I am just jumping right in. Uh, the strategy I'm really using here is um, to drop horizontals and verticals, which just means that I'm just comparing where does the bottom of the eye line up with the pupil? Does the corner of the lip line up with the nose? Like just constantly checking, checking, checking. Um, I have had a lot of practice doing portraits, uh, especially in the last couple of years. And, you know, believe it or not, the more you practice, the easier these things come. <laughs> I don't just say that. It's, it's completely true. In fact, I would suggest if accuracy is something you're interested in um, maintaining a sketchbook or drawing practice and just draw you know magazines pinterest your children whatever you have at hand and just you know don't be precious with it but just familiarize yourself with that and um yeah so here i like i said i'm just sort of checking uh off screen is my reference photo in my hand but um, i'm marking things in slowly note that i'm not doing a ton of curvilinear lines i'm really just etching and um you know this drawing is gonna be perfect and most of it gets covered up by the end so i'm not really being too precious with it but i'm just seeing you know where where does the edge of the ear line up you know and really checking in on those things and seeing how that how that's lining up i'm going to show you guys here so this is me dropping a horizontal so i'm checking that the top of the eye does it match up with the other eye? A lot of times, especially at three-fourths, we tend to think that the eyes are perfectly lined up, um, but usually one eye is slightly higher or lower. Um, and so, you know, it's important to check check those things. Um, and yeah, it's, it's all just a matter of checking and going back and forth. Um, a lot of times the way I work these days, is I really just get kind of a rough sketch in and then I measure. Um, but there's a lot of tools you can use. You can use a device that it's like a protractor, um, but basically you can take one side and measure out your reference photo. So like if you're having a hard time, for example, with the distance between the eyes, you can measure it on the small side of the protractor. And then um, on the other side, 
you can it has the ratio saved and you can sort of do that way just google drawing protractor um let's see ratio tool i'm sure you can find something um another thing you could do is the grid system that is obviously a very popular strategy for using um for getting a really accurate drawing you can use a projector you know it's there's nothing wrong with that i think it's just it's a nice skill to be able to draw but it's just a tool like we're not morally attached to these things um but it's something at your disposal that you can use um, and then of course there's the dowel rod method and sort of measuring using um you know just the div the strategy i showed you guys in the foundations course i just call this measuring <laughs> um but you can do a bunch of different strategies so I'm going to be drawing for a few minutes here. It's a lot of just like dabbing and checking and dabbing and checking. It's a pretty boring um, part of the composition. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about the medium. So in the full course, I do um, a, a painting and a couple studies in acrylic. And then I do um, a painting, I think, I think just a, no, I do a full painting in oil. Um, and then I think I do a study in oil. And then I do the final painting with an acrylic underpainting and an oil painting on top. That last strategy is kind of the most similar to the my favorite portrait painting strategy. Um, and I did this for a few reasons. One, I've had a lot of people ask to do more oil tutorials. I started this course um, in acrylics. I still believe in the power of teaching in acrylics. I think it's the most forgiving and it really promotes the most uh, confident choice making and learning uh, by failing, which I think is just integral to being an artist. Um, but I, I think oil is fantastic. I think they're, you know, oil and acrylic are sisters. They're very similar. You know, I, I have painted extensively in watercolor and it feels incredibly different <laughs> than the other two. Um, but I wanted to be able to teach to both and have both. So there is a, a segment that's coming out really dedicated to talking a little bit about oils. Um, I'm hoping in the future to do kind of a deep dive into mediums, like maybe even having a course dedicated to touring a, a plant how, where they make paints and really deep diving into um, mediums. But, um, but I wanted to, you know, show how versatile oils can be. I, you know, I think that the one's not the finished product. One isn't better than the other. There's a little bit of stigma and I think it's a dying trend. I don't think it's, I don't think it's, I think it's kind of an old school way of thinking, but that oil is somehow superior because it's more traditional or the classics used it and acrylic because it's made of plastic and it's newer is lesser. Um, and it really wasn't lent any credibility until Andy Warhol started painting with it. And, you know, he's a divisive figure. So even then, um, <laughs> it was still under scrutiny. But I remember whenever I graduated from college and I started to price my work, one of the strategies I used was to use a painting calculator, a painting price calculator. And my artwork was priced quite a bit lower um, than if I had painted in oil. And I remember being very confused and thinking that that was kind of an odd thing um but anyways it's I just thought it would be good to have both to be able to show you both to be able to work into both and teach at both so if you don't want to paint in oil a lot of this still stacks up um in fact this might even be easier <laughs> because there's a lot of layering in acrylic um but I wanted to be able to do both okay so here I'm blocking in the average shadow it's just the color I mixed up um, if you look at the reference photo, it's all of, you know, her face doesn't have a ton of shadow in it. It's, it's pretty directly lit and there's quite a bit of ambient light in this photo. Um, obviously the more direct light you have and the more shadow on the face, the larger this will be. But instead of getting sucked into all the detail in the shadow, I am really encouraging you guys to just hop in and make a statement with the shadow. So there's not a lot of her face, even around the eye doesn't have a ton of shadow. Um, and so then I just jump in with, I believe I jump in with her hair color next. And that's just to establish my darkest values. The hair color is about a half step darker. I think it wouldn't be totally off base to just continue the average shadow color into her hair. Um, but, the, you know, there's no right or wrong way to do this. Basically, the average shadow just helps us establish our darkest values for the most part obviously there will be some places that get pulled darker but um we would want to make sure we don't go too dark in the beginning and 
uh, or too light in the beginning because it's hard to pull back in value. And I would argue that one of the most important parts of portrait painting is being relatively accurate with the value. Obviously there's no rights or wrongs, but you know, a lot of times people struggle with the face looking very cartoonish. And if that's the case, likely you're not investigating your half tones and you know, all the little values that are sort of in between the shadows and the lit part of the face. If you're not fully finding those, it can look very flat. And instead of just focusing on the middle tones, sometimes it can be helpful to go ahead and bracket your darkest tones. And what I mean by bracket is just if you sort of establish and say, this is the darkest value, don't go any darker. Um, you have a little bit of space at the end if you want to bring the pupils really dark or if there's a shadow under a chin or in a, you know, a socket of your face somewhere that you really need to... Um, darken to make things pop you have access to that because you didn't go all the way dark in the beginning even if you feel like it was pretty inaccurate even if you think that it could go quite a bit darker you want to preserve that um, as much as you can so you know mixing up this average shadow really helps you do that and it also helps you jump into the painting without overthinking it just sort of establishing that form and it also helps you break up looking at the face as one like shape you know you color in the the profile or whatever and really it forces you to look at the face as a bunch of different planes which is one of the most helpful things when you're looking at a face is to understand it instead of a, like, like a drawing instead of like a coloring book or a drawing as you're just capturing light hitting the different planes of the face and so one thing that's helpful especially if you're finding a bunch of the half tones and subtle values in the face is I find establishing as much value as you can right out the gate. And since I've toned this with a nice ruddy mid-tone color, you know, I have a lot of tones already sort of found, just, you know, a bonus space. It reminds me of, uh, when you're, is it bingo when you have that free space in the middle? You know, when you tone your background, um, sometimes you get free spaces um and since I'm doing a, a kind of a naturally tone you know I likely this color will be accurate a couple places of the painting or close to it and um, when you go in with the dark it feels like you've already found a lot more of the painting than you maybe have actually so yeah we're just looking here you can do quite a bit of drawing with the darker values really carving out the form I think I carved out the earring by basically just drawing around it um and you know if you're newer and you can't quite do that don't worry about it like if this looks really messy your first go just remember you can always refine you know there's no need to get this done in one day if you use um like a gamsol odorless mineral spirit and a fast dry gal kid gel which is um i'll try to link to some of those things too um if you use those, usually it can dry in about a day and the next day you can just layer on top just like you would with acrylic. Um, and, you know, that can be a strategy. You can just make a mess and then come back in and really carve out your, your painting. Basically, I'm just trying to say, like, it doesn't have to look perfect. And in fact, I, you know, this painting came together fairly easy <laughs> and I kind of resent that because I really think it's important to show what flailing and you know because that's such part of the process you know my paintings never are linear just a race to a perfect painting and um you know portraits are no different I think it can be easy to see really seductive portraits <laughs> on um Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and the, you know time lapse it all looks like it comes together so uh perfectly but yeah it doesn't always happen like that and certainly I've had my fair share of portraits crash and burn and I will say the more it kind of is a battle in the beginning you know especially if you're really trying to find likeness and you're really trying to be accurate and you're really trying to find those subtle value shifts um it kind of sets you up for a better finished product versus if you're just really committed to it looking finished and polished and then you get to the end and like the eye is three millimeters too high and the nose is four inches too wide and you know it can just look really wonky so um, but yeah, now I'm going in with my average lit, I believe. Um, so I'm not getting those highlights of the, the face. You can also go in with your average highlight here and sort of leave um, this color um, 
the average lit blank. Uh, there's not really a wrong way to do this, but definitely you want to start coming in at it with the other direction. So um, whether that's your highlights or your, your half tones or um, you know something in between, you just are starting to block some of that in. And that's certainly what I'm doing here. And I will say at this point, I'm always, you know, without the highlights, I always get a little <laughs> anxious that, um, that maybe my color was really wrong. But I think it's that same thing that happens where you just don't have enough information and, and without the background color and the highlights and the dark corners of the eye and the lips, like it can just start to look a little mask like, <laughs> uh, but I painted enough to know that this is definitely a trust the process moment. And even if this color is way wrong, you can always mix up another color and go back in later. I also think the background being so warm is uh, throwing me a bit. I will say I try not to paint on super bright canvases when I do portraits, um, especially if I'm doing it a little more classic, a more classic style portrait. Um, <laughs> it can be helpful to not start on like hot pink or bright orange. Um, but you know there's no right or wrong but I, I will say if you start with the right color it's usually at this part of the block in phase that you're you're like why is the skin so gray but you know it doesn't look gray over on the palette and like I said if it's wrong I can always go back in later and then and, and modify it another thing you have creative control over is how much of the body you want to fill in how much of the the whole composition you want to fill in one of my favorite things about portraits is figuring out how much to leave unrendered. You know, I feel like with still lifes and landscapes and interior scapes, you know, there's a little bit, because we're just a little less familiar with those things than we are faces. Faces are just so core. You know, it's the first thing we recognize as infants and, um, you know, it's we're just so keyed into faces that, um, you know, it's, it's really easy to, like, you can do, like, two dots and a smudge, and people are going to read that as a face, where, you know, a tablescape may take a little more explaining to understand. Um, I try to use to my advantage the best I can that people are going to try to read a figure out of this, so if you can not fully finish the shoulders or the, the de negligee or, oh, what is that called? Negligee? Oh, man, I should look that up. <laughs> okay, decolletage. <laughs> Um, I probably should cut that out, but it's this is a long video. We'll be okay. Anyways, um, if you want to just hint at that by like scrubbing in a couple of different values and leaving that sort of understated, I always feel like it has a very John Singer Sargent vibe to it that can be really beautiful and endearing. But, you know, if you want it to be completely found and polished, that's totally fine too. There's no right or right, wrong way to do this, but I will say take into mind that, you know, people really want to see faces and what you paint. And so you can do less explaining than you think you do. And that can be really exciting as a painter, especially because, you know, the other mediums are going to capture someone perfectly, you know, all details of their face. And, you know, being able to sort of leave some of it unwound and unfound can be so charming. But again, that might be a subjective personal take. Um, if I remember right, by this point, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed by... <laughs> the composition in the state. And so I am problem solving, problem solving by saying, maybe if I block in the background color, which is pretty light compared to everything, um, it'll help me make better value choices. And I think that was the right choice. I think it did help me if I remember right. Um, but the background is like a cream color and my uh, toned um, ground of my canvas is still a little bit wet. So it makes this lovely creamy color. Um, which was really fun, but, um, yeah, doing this was really helpful. Remember as a painter, you know, this is why I try not to get too committed to steps because you just need to do what helps and serves you and as you're painting something. So, you know, and another, another painter who's teaching this may have the background be the last thing you do, but I was really struggling with the values and the background is not super far away from the face. And I do think it sort of affects the way we interpret the values and colors on the face. And so for me, this was helpful. And I think with every composition, it's going to be different. And I also think it's important as artists that you discover what works for you because we all problem solve differently. <laughs> you know, if you've been out in the world at any capacity, 
that's, you know, you just see other people do things. Like we all just think and operate so differently. So for me to prescribe one specific way to do anything always feels a little bit um, bold. <laughs> You know, but I do think starting with an average shadow, for example, is like a, a wonderful way to jump in. But I also know painters who start in with the highlights. So there's, you know, again, there's no wrong. Um, but use it as a guide pole. Try it out a couple times. If it works for you, great. And, you know, if you don't love it, then you can just modify. There's nothing wrong with that. So, yeah, I blocked the background in and I was feeling uh, quite a bit better with, with the painting at this. It's, you know, it's amazing what adjusting all the levers can do you know if you're struggling with one part of your composition I would always encourage you to look at all of the other parts of your painting um so now I am I'm kind of at a crossroads what do I do I'm gonna start working in I think some of the half tones um I do block in her eyebrows because they uh, I think it was just a little bit because they bothered me but also because um, I wanted to start anchoring the face, so like parts of the lip and under the nose. They're not all really shadow. I think maybe under the nose could be considered shadow technically, but they didn't quite make it into that average shadow, you know, burst I did in the beginning of the painting, but I still wanted to pull back the value. So I, you know, I went ahead and got those relatively blocked in, and everything from this point on is me sort of just pivoting between half tones and highlights and shadows and half tones and highlights and shadows and I'm really responding believe it or not it's my goal to kind of get to this point because I know from being really keyed into my reference photo and pre-mixing the colors I'm moving really slow and deliberately that my values are all kind of in the ballpark of where I want them and so I feel like when you do a lot of that work in the beginning you can kind of play and not worry you know if you're confident in the base you know the, the foundation of your color relationships um when you do stuff like pick the lip color and pick the color of the bridge of the nose and sort of make those choices you know you're not going to be way off because you've already done the work of the shadow of the nose and the lip part of the nose and the lip part of the cheek and you know it's just easier you feel more supported in your choices i think is a good way of describing it so here I'm sort of just trying to finish um, covering the canvas. It doesn't all have to be covered, um, but I'm asking myself a very familiar question in my painting practice, which is what's bothering you the most? Um, you know, the planes of the face are all relatively blocked in. I'm, I'm obviously missing a substantial amount of the highlights. I have a lot of the midtones. Obviously I have a lot of the shadow blocked in. Um, but I know that I tend to overdo highlights and, you know, this is a beautiful, um, woman who has darker skin and I have made the mistake of highlights kind of going from highlight to like really like augmenting the skin color, you know, in the sense that it's easy to do in any direction. It's easy to make skin really muddy. It's easy to, you know, do any of that. And I just have to understand that my natural proclivity is to go bonkers with the highlights I you know I do that in my still lives I do that in, in just about anything that is you know reflects light in any capacity and so just for my process I established the midtones and the shadows and I'm just slowly working my way up to those highlights but I understand that they you know it looks pretty flat without them and so um you know but I'm building up to it and another thing I am doing at this point is um, blocking in this lovely blue color around her mouth. Obviously, <laughs> it looks a little aggressive right now. Um, I do want it in a couple places to be that bright. The, you know, the thing about oil is I can blend it in a bit. I don't lean into this strategy a ton, you know, understanding that, like, I will blend it in. But, um, unlike acrylics, which kind of work in the opposite direction, where you... you can only go brighter and brighter and brighter you know if you're doing acrylics you want to make sure you blend neutral and keep everything kind of muted before you start to go in with your bright colors or else it'll look really flat and not that that's a bad thing but just you know it can look really like two-dimensional and flat in an unintentional way anyways the opposite sort of predicament happens with oil especially if you're doing all a prima um wet on wet is that you can create mud which is just you lose your intensity. Um, so I have found 
that as crazy as it looks <laughs> by going in with a brighter color and sort of forcing myself to find a way to make tones that are halfway between that bright blue and the you know warm sienna ochre color of her cheek by asking myself what color is there a lot of times I can pull back on that um and by having that bright color already popped in there um I don't have to work my way up to that color I can kind of make that color statement have it be bright and then see if I can pull the intensity of the face up um a little bit especially because I feel like this face was feeling kind of dull um a little bit my biggest gripe with it I think by this point is just that it wasn't really rich in the way I wanted it to be. And I understand a lot of that's probably missing that dimension of highlight um, in the front of the face. But anyways, that's kind of what I'm thinking as I'm going. You know, it's less that I know what my next step is and I'm perfectly executing it and more that, you know, you put down a thought and then you either marvel at your genius or more likely, at least for me, <laughs> you sort of have to put out a fire uh, metaphorically, you sort of have to, you know, literally you have to find colors that sort of mediate those, those bolder choices. But, you know, it's a game. It's all a game. Nothing is precious. It's paint. If I completely make a mess today, I can set this out for two or three days, let it completely dry and paint on top of it. And I'll have all of that wonderful knowledge I gained painting and some rest. And that is sometimes a really magical combo. So, you know, I really try not to be too precious with it. So another thing I'm doing is um, trying to keep the neck and the shoulders um, in the conversation with the painting. One thing that can be easy to do is you get really sucked into the face or one area of the face and you sort of forget the rest of it. And remember, we want to keep color harmony. And part of how you do that is by, you know, when you're done mixing in color um, and placing it on the face, Maybe ask yourself, is there anywhere else that this color can be used? And just, you know, more practically, don't go too long without also checking in with the the neck and shoulders, um, especially at this part of the composition. Um, you don't want to treat them like separate objects, like you don't want to have a perfectly made face and then a really harsh jump to the rest of the body. Well, less that you don't want that, but just something to be aware of. That could be a stylistic choice. There's no rights or wrongs, but... It's just something to keep in mind um, as you're working on your composition. And we've really hit, you know, just like the observation, like check and see part of the painting. I, you know, I feel like the beginning of a painting is just, it's a lot of action. You're just sort of scrubbing in and being brushy and just getting your thoughts on paper and trying to fill up the canvas. And it's just like, you know, sort of this fast movement towards a painting that looks like a painting. <laughs> And then when you get to this point, you know, you have some structure, things are starting to come together. Um, you know, for me, I tend to slow down, not because things are precious. I don't mind scrubbing over and, you know, moving things way around. Um, but because it's, you know, if you're one look, one mark in the beginning, you know, you look at your reference photo, you do one mark on your canvas and you keep going back and forth. I feel like by this point, maybe it's two looks and one mark. That's not always literal, but what I mean by that is just I'm being really purposeful. You know, I'm checking before I make big statements and, you know, seeing if just being more observant and, you know, more intentional and more purposeful with it. You know, just, it's, it's just, it's deliberate is I guess a really good word for that. Just very deliberate at this point, um, not to be confused with, with precious, but you know, just a lot of looking and taking in. And this is also a good point in the painting where you can start to really check your drawing a little bit and, um, you know, use your tools like a mirror or take a photo and sort of flip it. Um, you know, different things you can do to sort of get a little bit of space from the composition. Um, faces can really easily sort of implode on themselves more so than I, you know, anything else I've painted. Um, and you think it looks good and then you look at, you look at it in the mirror or something and you just, you're way off. Um, so remember to build in moments to check. But here I'm finally warming up to some of those highlights. 
Um, again, I really want to preserve, you know, I worked really hard for these beautiful, rich, you know, reds and ochres. Um, you know, I love, I love painting more pigmented skin tones because it's literally just the same uh, basic colors as, as any, you know, as a lighter skin person. It's just this, there's less titanium white, you know, and I'm a high chroma girl. So I love just really saturated colors. And there are certainly a lot of really beautiful reds and yellows and purples in this, you know, in this, in her skin, you know, for skin is like a kaleidoscope of colors. There's, there's just a lot of range. And, you know, I feel like an easy way to flatten that is by going way too crazy with highlights. So if I'm seeming a little meek and mild, um, in addition to just watching this happen in real time, <laughs> it's, it's because this is kind of the game I'm playing. I, you know, I've painted enough now where I'm like, this is a trap for me. <laughs> I want to make the skin like as luminous as it is in the rep reference photo. And, um, you know, there's definitely too much of a good thing. So I'm trying to work up. And then also, you know, what, what feels like a highlight, it feels so blindingly light, you know, the, the shiny part of the front of the cheek you know, because of all the different values in her, the, you know, the deeper values in her skin tone, you don't have to go as as light as you think to get that really shiny, lit, lit glowing from within look. And so, you know, just being really intentional, making really good observations um, is helpful. You know, I, I also, one thing that's easy to do, and I've said this with other painting courses, is using white as just your main way to titanium white as your main way to lighten and lift up the value um and I would always be really careful of that especially with you know deeper more pigmented skin tones I find that a lot of times going for a yellow ochre or a lighter raw sienna like Michael Harding has a really good um raw sienna that's it's nice and uh, relatively light um that trying to mix a highlight um with those first is is just really helpful uh, as opposed to just taking the color you mixed for you know the the bigger larger planes of our face and then just adding white to it that can just get really chalky um really fast and it just does such a disservice to how you know rich and luminous like her skin tone is and so you just want to be careful um you know obviously in some skin tones are very light and you do end up using a lot of titanium white um as a way to get your value lighter. Um, but even then, just, you know, be really observant. I have painted people who are very, very fair, and I find that like a pale violet um, can actually do quite a bit of lifting uh, without reaching for white. And that's something that's kind of unique to really fair skin tones. So just, you know, I, I guess if I can give you one piece of advice, it's just try not to create formulas. Try to really just respond to the skin you're looking at um, and you know, everyone's skin tone is so different. It's so unique. I think that's why, I mean, that's certainly one of the reasons I'm really drawn to painting portraits, but you know, there's a reason people can just paint portraits their whole lives and never get sick of it is because there's every face in different lighting has different, you know, color stories and all those different nuances of values. And, and it's just, it's so beautiful anyways kind of geeking out right now but um but yeah that's kind of the conversation I'm having at this point and then now I'm going in and I'm bringing down some of those values right I was really conservative in the beginning of not wanting to blow out my dark values I really wanted to give myself the space in the future to um to be able to deepen you know with a little bit of I wanted to have enough control to deepen things in the future and I think by not going super super duper dark I now can sort of begin to um punctuate and and bring up uh you know the shadow of the hair that was a really nice change and yeah now we're on to kind of the final part the last little bits of refining so for me when I get to this point you know and I don't have all the highlights and the shiny bits I have to ask myself does this function right now like is this understandable is there any part of the face that's sort of imploding on itself? And, you know, there, there's like a weird notch in her hair. <laughs> um, I wanted to leave a little bit of scalp showing, but, you know. But other than that, this for me actually functions pretty well. And so that's usually my sign that I can, I can kind of finish. I will say for me personally, I really like to give myself a day. <laughs> you know, if I, even if I did really, like a painting came together really smoothly, 
I like to try to give myself like a full night's sleep before I come in and do the the final touches on the painting. I really, you know, it's helpful to do that for me. So anyways, but everyone's different and, you know, it's all good. But if you're really struggling, you know, if you feel kind of burnt out, like, you know, catch some Z's, come back in and, and then, you know, begin to refine your composition. All right, so I believe I'm mixing up some uh, colors here, some slightly different highlights. Um, I don't believe when my color mixing, I mixed colors light enough. I really, you know, by the time I get to the highlight, um, a lot of my thought process has changed. My palette has shifted a bit. That's all pretty normal. And so I try not to um, mix my highlights just because anytime I've done that, for the most part, I end up ditching them. Um, and, you know, so the, the, the highlight that I said earlier, it was just like the high point of the, um, the forehead and the bridge of the nose and maybe the top of the cheek that you, you see now. But the part that I'm adding in right now, um, in this final kind of bit of the painting, um, it really should have a separate word for that. It's like the highlight and then there's like the little shiny dots. I don't know. <laughs> um, by the time I get to these, I, I just, so much has changed. I, you know, and I, I rarely use what I mixed. So I, and also they're, it's volume wise pretty small. Like they're just, it's not a lot. So um, I, it's pretty normal for me to just mix up a, a little bit. And a lot of times I'll use the colors I already have on the palette, like a little bit from those, but just mix, you know, yellow, pale violet, white into those. Um, but that's sort of what I'm adding now. I'm getting a little bit of that um, reflected light. A lot of times when you have um, a three-fourths view, you get this lovely little bit of light on the edge. And of course, I overdid it because um, that's very on-brand for me, but it's all good. You can always carve it back out. And so I'm going back in with a um, color and just sort of carving it. No big deal. No sweat off my shoulders. Um, but yeah, what I'm usually thinking at this point is I solve one thing and then I see a problem, you know, something that needs to be fixed while I'm in that part of the face. <laughs> and that's kind of how I guide myself through, you know, the end of the painting or like the dismount is another way of think of it. Like, how do you, how do you know when you're done? And basically I just, I work around the face and I get to a point where I, don't think there's anything I can solve at least not right now and not in this headspace and I you know just have to humbly say all right I've done what I can and um and call it but at this point you know I'm just sort of hopping around the face and you know there's a lot more that still needs to be refined but again the further you get into the painting the more you sort of observe and you sit with it and then you decide if it needs to be changed so this is a very slow process it's definitely not the most entertaining um, especially in real time. <laughs> I contemplated speeding this up, but I, I'd rather have awkward banter, I think, sometimes, and just have it, you know, the full thing flush out, than, than maybe skip over some good parts. So I think, you know, having a real-time demo every once in a while can be really helpful. Um, but yeah, just like with highlights, we go in and kind of punctuate the lightest parts. I also find that I you end up with sort of the darker end of the value scale, the equivalent. Um, just re-carving out some some shadows that have gotten gotten lost a little bit. And if you remember when we did our average shadow in the beginning, it's the average, which means that some of the lighter parts of the shadow became darker. And then of course, on the other hand, some of the darker shadows um, was lighter. And so I'm going in here now, and I'm I'm bringing some of those down, um, just where I need. It. And the thing is, like, it, I'm always surprised it's less than you think. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know, I don't know why, you know, my brain works like this or maybe it's everyone's, but, uh, it's just so easy to make your, your shadows on a face so dark. And that's so often like a mistake, like, you know, they're, they're not holes in your face. You know, a face has quite a bit of luminosity, especially in light like this. Um, and so, yeah, I, I find, you know, in the beginning I'm like, oh, I'll go back in and I'll make all those way darker, um, when I'm putting in my average shadow. And then by this point I'm like, oh yeah, it's just a couple small accents. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is, you know, I would consider this painting, it's not like the most highly rendered painting. I don't think that I have the capacity to do that in one pass. Um, I certainly, I've done um, a really highly rendered portrait of my son, a pretty large portrait, and I think I took many days to do it. And you can really push your level of realism. But for me, where I'm at, 
you know, I, I find that having some breaks and time in between and really utilizing better drawing methods, you know, more accurate. So maybe using something like a grid um, can be helpful if I'm going to, you know, if I'm really committed to having something super accurate. Um, but for me, a little a la prima study, this is, this is pretty exciting. You know, I think I captured what I wanted to about her face in the beginning. Um, and so, yeah, this is, at this point, I'm getting pretty excited. <laughs> I hope you guys are enjoying this demo. Um, honestly, it's, it's always great practice, but um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that you guys had some portrait painting uh, material in the beginning of August. And so um, yeah, just took a little bit of time out and wanted to do some some demos and basically show you guys a little bit of the process. Obviously in the How to Paint Portrait, the full not sorry art school section uh things are explained differently i would argue better <laughs> than my little at home recording um it, you know i do more studies and more uh a lot less rambling <laughs> but it's also just you know i construct teaching a course versus maybe just rattling off a demo is pretty they're pretty different beasts you know um a course it's really like the pacing and stuff is really just like throwing as much information at you and really getting the terms down and you know because when you're a teacher you teach to both people who just want to watch it happen and sort of learn best by just seeing someone wing it and they're good to go but you know there's also students who really want all the steps broken down and they want the terminology and they want to hear a few different ways to approach it. And they really, you know, they want to, their hands held a little bit. And I, I totally get that. When I'm learning some things, that's how I am. And with other things, I can kind of wing it. So, you know, when you're constructing a course, you're really speaking to all of those different things. Where a demo is just, you know, very valuable. I've, you know, certainly paid good money for demos by really talented artists. And they're so fascinating to watch. Um but they're, they're definitely different, but I, I wanted to give you guys, um, yeah, basically something to, to chew through and really look at and, um, you know, right away. That being said, I'm really excited about the course. You know, we made sure to get a nice, relatively diverse group of models. You know, I'd love to continue to add on and do demos. You know, we put out four courses a year and, um, I try to do one really good comprehensive course every year, one that's like really built out and teaches a whole new thing. Um, but that it is an enormous amount of work. And so I'm hoping that over the next year or two, we can incorporate some demos that are just, you know, they're really well constructed and really built out. And maybe there's a couple of new key ideas, but, um, but yeah, we just keep adding on to our, you know, people who get painted and different approaches to hair and lighting and skin color and you know maybe do full body paintings and you know just I you know I really want to continue to expand this so um you know even just getting to add on this little informal demo is pretty pretty awesome pretty special I'm just realizing how much the pace really slows down at the end, <laughs> um, which is pretty enlightening to me. I, I should watch more of my painting at real time. <laughs> so I think this is like the first time I've done that. Um, cause I usually, the first thing I do when I'm editing is I crank the speed all the way up. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's interesting to see, uh, just how slow <laughs> I am at the end. <laughs> Maybe it's a good tool for you guys. If you feel like you're in a place where you're kind of you just want some more feedback on your art, try recording yourself at speed and watching it back. It's very enlightening. Um, but yeah, just making small moves. I think there's enough here that, you know, I would say maybe the, the word precious has entered the chat in the sense that I do really enjoy a lot of what's on the painting. And so I don't want to like glob it up. Not that that's the end of the world. You can always recover from anything, you know, no big deal. Um, but I really, there's some things happening that I think are really lovely. So just observing, asking myself, what has to be fixed? What needs to be fixed? Because certainly there's a lot on here that isn't fully found in the sense that it's, I don't know, maybe not found, but isn't fully rendered perfectly to look photorealistically like skin. But is that inherently a bad thing? Is that negative? Does it have to be, is it okay that it looks like brush marks? 
if you step back, does it still function as form? And yeah, I think a lot of it does. So you don't want to disrupt a lot of that lovely, brushy, thicker, you know, more full-bodied movement that has happened. You don't want to erase that history, um, but you do want to refine. So it's just yeah, asking yourself again, over and over, what needs to be fixed? What can be left alone? What's working? What's not working? I hope you guys are enjoying watching this. I hope wherever you're at, you're, you know, excited to paint, excited to jump back into it. Um, also, kind of on a side note, <laughs> uh, remember that observing is part of painting, right? Um, if, sometimes if we're not painting, it can feel like we're not progressing or getting better or, you know, that that's inaction in some way. And, you know, one thing my painting professor told me in college was that just to remember that, you know, observing, watching, learning, taking in is part of the process. So if you're in a season of life where you're, you're more observing than painting, um, that's part of it. And, and don't feel bad. You know, there's ebbs and flows to painting. There are certainly seasons of life where I do more taking in, more reading, more observing nature and others than I do painting and that's totally fine totally normal <laughs> and part of the process sometimes it's tough though because you can't you can't turn that into content you can't sell you know quiet observation online <laughs> and so therefore it's a little less valued but it's still incredibly valuable I think this is reminding me that I need to do um, an ear study <laughs> Uh, I struggle with ears and I and I've painted long enough to know that that's not a unique Siri is bad at ears thing it's more it's just I haven't given it time and attention right I used to feel that way about um, hands I felt that way about certain proportions I felt I felt that way about figures like I just can't paint people like I've, I've said that before so you know that's that's not true it's just I haven't given myself time to to work on it I did a challenge I think last year where I painted a bunch of hands in the span of a month and it was amazing I started out kind of one of those people who maybe would have said that I'm not very good at hands and I ended thinking like I want to turn this into a whole series so you just be amazed what practice can do so I just need to sit down and like crank out a bunch of ears <laughs> and then I'll be I'll be an ear person, I guess, but, um, watching this back, I'm just kind of marveling at the fact that I need to practice that more. <laughs> um, again, with the highlights with the eyes, they're not always needed. I've learned, you know, the hard way from messing out a perfectly rendered iris, um, and then placing a big old blob of mostly titanium white on top of it that basically like not every eye needs a highlight. Um, in fact, really her left eye is the only one with a highlight, um, in it and uh yeah not every not every painting needs it and so you have to be really discerning and also not all highlights are created equal they're not all little round circles sometimes they're more scratchy sometimes it's more of a u-shape um sometimes it's a squiggle and so just being really honest with yourself like are you painting a little white dot because like that means finished eye or is that something you're actually seeing um you know just be really honest and sure you can fib it a little bit but I found that more times than not fibbing it just does not end well because <laughs> um, it gives away the lighting and if you have a really shiny dot and like you're in low light it just kind of looks weird and artificial but you know maybe that's what you're going for there's nothing wrong with that inherently just something to be aware of and so basically here I'm sort of just incorporating what I was talking about earlier which is just not to forget the rest of the body and, you know, just be really intentional with, uh, not just over rendering the face, you know, and that's subjective. Like to someone like this is way under rendered, like I, it just, it looks like a sketchy mess. And to someone else, like this is, I way overdid it. So it's, it's really subjective. Um, but I guess like what I'm trying to get you guys to think about in your own work is not finishing for finishing sake. Um, a lot of times we can unknowingly relinquish our control because we think something has to be perfect or finished or, you know, whatever. Um, and really how, how much you choose to resolve something is, is, is as much of a stylistic choice as your color palette and your drawing style. So, you know, just keeping that in mind, but 
yeah, this is this is the painting. Um, this was really fun I to, to film. I hope you guys enjoyed watching it. I hope it was informational in any capacity. Um, let me know what you think, and I will try to provide some of those links down below. Um, and I'm really excited to start seeing your guys' portraits. Um, that's always the best part of releasing something is seeing what you guys make. So make sure to tag me. Um, feel free to give me any feedback. And I hope you enjoyed watching it, and thank you for being here. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. I hope you get a chance to make some art. And yeah, I just can't say thank you enough.